Hi, this is Frank Taylor with Nature at Your Door. I'm here in southwest Virginia at 2,700 feet on my land in the Appalachian Mountains. And behind me here, you can see this old wagon road. And this road is lined with three species of oak, scarlet oak, chestnut oak, and white oak. And it's the white oaks, which include the chestnut oaks, are in a mast year. And you can see there are tons and tons of acorns here. It's a bumper crop. So in this episode, we're going to take a look at these trees, discuss what mast is, what is a mast year, what drives it, and why these trees do this on occasion. And also take a look at some not so well known, some new research that's going into looking at how trees communicate. So stay tuned. Right here in your backyard, you never know what you're going to find. I want to begin this episode talking about what mast is. Mast is defined as the fruits of forest trees and shrubs. There's two kinds of masts. There's hard mast and soft mast. Hard mast would include the fruits of things like beech trees, oak trees, maple trees, oaks, and hickories. Soft mast would include the softer fruits like blueberries, huckleberries, the fruits on Japanese honeysuckle or on Virginia creeper. Hard mast and soft mast, of course, is really important to wildlife, both during the year, but especially in the winter when foraging gets very tough for a lot of different animals. If there's a lot of mast, animals are healthy and strong and reproduce. If the mast is poor due to environmental conditions or other reasons, the populations of wildlife may suffer. You'll hear wildlife biologists, ecologists, and hunters talk about mast years or masting. And a mast year is when there's an abundance of one particular type of mast. Mast years may occur between every one and five years. They're very difficult to predict. And so it's an irregular synchronization of producing an abundance of seeds. I mean hundreds or thousands of times more than normal. Here on this road, I have several different kinds of oak trees. This is a red oak or scarlet oak, and you can see that it has kind of ski tracks in its bark. And it's identified by these pointy shaped leaves. And you can see around the base, there are very, very few acorns. There's one or two here or there, but there's very few acorns. So this, the red oaks here are not producing very many acorns. I take a few steps here and the ground is absolutely covered with acorns. These are acorns are from this chestnut oak and there's a couple of them clustered here. You can see this chestnut oak has this very distinct, chunky, blocky bark, making it really easy to recognize this tree by its bark. The leaves of chestnut oak come in various sizes and shapes, but they all have this distinctly scalloped margin. By the way, oak trees are notorious producing for a variety of different shaped leaves, and these are shade leaves that you tend to find at the bottom of the tree that are much larger and adapted to gaining more sunlight. And these are likely to be uh, sun leaves, which you'll find at the top of the tree where they're exposed to high degrees of sunlight. Walking farther down the trail, I come to this magnificent white oak. And you can see that its bark is different from the other trees around it. It seems to have this thin, flaky bark with a characteristic pattern. Contrasting with the leaves of this red oak that are lobed with pointed margins to them, the white oak leaves are lobed and have round edges on them. Underneath this white oak, you can see that there is a, an abundance of acorns. These aren't as big as the acorns of the, the chestnut oak, but they're pretty thick here through the ground, and this is definitely a white oak mast year. 
So in this mast year here locally in southwest Virginia, my friends are telling me where they live, sometimes many miles away, that they're seeing massive quantities of acorns this year as well, and particularly from the chestnut oaks. And here on my property, it's the most chestnut oak acorns I've ever seen, and they are the largest. Some of them seem to be almost as big as quail eggs. The size of acorns is dictated a lot by the tree, the health of the tree, the age of the tree, and environmental conditions. These really big ones were from a chestnut oak that was very close to a spring that runs year round. Biologists aren't really certain at what causes a mass year. It seems to be tied to a warm temperatures in the spring or a mild late winter when the oak trees bloom so that the flowers are not frozen off by a sharp freeze and the flowers stay alive long enough to be pollinated by lots of pollinators. The second factor that leads to a mast year is the amount of rainfall during the summertime. The oaks need a certain amount of rain. It takes a lot of sunlight, a lot of energy, and a lot of water to produce this biologically expensive thing called a nut or acorn. The third factor is a little more mysterious. How do trees across a very broad area coordinate and massed at the same time. Trees we know now are connected by mycelium. Their roots extend out and from the roots ectomyosoriosal fungi connect to other trees. And it's been demonstrated that a tree can push carbon to another tree that might be suffering or in the shade. Sometimes the oak trees of one particular species in several states or maybe the northeast coast will mass together. So it seems to be beyond just these environmental conditions. There has to be some kind of coordination or communication be the trees through chemicals, pheromones, either through the roots or through the air. So it's a really fascinating area of biology that's just getting a lot of new looks and a lot of research now. The final question, and the really big question, is why do trees do this? Well, it uh, relates to a biological concept called predator satiation. The concept is if a plant can produce more seeds than a predator can eat, in this area, the predators on acorns, for example, would be deer, bear, turkey, and squirrels. And so when the trees mass, they produce so many seeds or so many acorns, the predators can't eat them all. So that you have a much better chance of some of those sprouting and becoming a new tree. So what happens to wildlife in a masting year? Well, they're satiated. They do really well, they're healthy, strong, more likely to survive winter, and they're more likely to reproduce and produce more offspring. So after a mast year, you typically see an increase in the abundance of various wildlife species that are tied to the acorns or whatever their seed that might be masting that year. But for the next years, remember a mast year may only occur once every five years, the populations tend to decline because there's not that mast. And it's particularly important for animals in the winter. So their health declines, their numbers decline, the amount of reproduction declines. And then that's when is the best time to have another mast year, when the predator uh, populations on the particular seed are low, then the plant produces lots and lots of stuff that predators are satiated and they have a better chance of survival to a mature tree. Well, I hope you enjoyed this episode of Nature at Your Door here at 2,700 feet in the Appalachian Mountains of Southwest Virginia. And I hope you learned a lot of new stuff about mass and gave you something to think about as you think about how trees and forests actually work and look at and consider the network of trees and how they communicate. Remember, if you like my channel, you like what I do, please give me a like, subscribe, and check out my playlist. I'm well over 200 videos in, and I've got coverage of almost every topic you can think of, of anything you might find outside, from insects to salamanders to snakes, reptiles, turtles, trees, and fungi. 
I cover everything that you might find when you walk out your door. So thanks again for watching this episode of Nature at Your Door.